I think where people went from many of the buffalo jumps was to what we might call their winter camps. Many, buffalo jumps and pounds were used at many different seasons of the year, but we can tell from archaeological evidence and from oral history that many jumps were used in the fall. That was probably the prime season for buffalo pounds and jumps, and there's a whole uh, number of very good reasons for that. A lot of it has to do with the condition of the animal at that time of year. Buffalo are really prime, especially the cows, and this is the time you want to put away meat and fat for the fall. And of course, the other thing is you want a store of surplus meat and fat to get you through the difficult winter that's coming. People are now going to move to their winter camps. They're going to set up teepees and stay in one place for a relatively long period of time compared to the summer months when they really move frequently. And when you do that now, you're taking this surplus of meat and fat with you. And we all know what a winter on the northern plains can be like. Getting out for killing fresh animals at any time could be extremely challenging, sometimes literally impossible. And this gives you that store of food to fall back on anytime you need it. And pemmican is highly nutritious. It's full of uh, protein from the meat and energy uh, from the fat content and, of course, the berries itself. So it's a tremendously energetic food. In fact, you can live practically on pemmican for weeks and months if you had to. So they did all these things. They took the hides. They prepared them for scraping to make into teepee covers, which is a very important part of their culture. They needed new hides constantly for teepee covers. They made winter robes out of teepee hides. They made moccasins and other winter clothing. Buffalo hide is generally too thick for most clothing, like, like shirts and pants, so it was not used for that purpose. But it was used for, uh, for uh, covers in teepees and for bedding and so on. So all this would follow in the wake of a buffalo hunt, such as here at Head Smashton. And this took days and days, and it, much of it happened down on the flats below me here on this level prairie, where they had spread out, take their room, and, and uh, probably hundreds of people en engaged in this. The other important thing down on the prairie is that there's a, a source of water. There's a natural spring that seeps out from the bedrock here at the jump. It flows across the prairie, uh, leaving the channel that you see now. And people could go to that and get water. And of course, water would be critical for any buffalo jump, not only for the people to drink to stay alive and uh, uh, subsist on during the days that they're here, but to use in the butchering and processing of the animal. They did a lot of cooking, a lot of boiling of pits in the ground, and all that required water. So many of us feel you won't even find a buffalo jumper a pound anywhere a considerable distance from water. These were some of the things that happened in the days after the, the jump was over. I can picture dozens of teepees down here, hundreds and hundreds of people, busy almost around the clock. Uh, you're trying to avoid spoilage of the meat and the fat, and, and you had so much to do that people probably took shifts and slept for a few hours and got back up. Fires burned through the night. Uh, people worked literally uh, almost around the clock for days and days. And also, scavengers and predators are starting to get the smell of all this now. They're probably starting to come into this area and be a bit of a nuisance to these people. I think people left the site relatively quick quickly. Head Smashed Inn and many of the other buffalo jumps we know of were not campsites. They're not permanent residents. You don't stay in a place like this. It's a place you come for a specific purpose. You do your work and you move on. And where they moved to in the case of Head Smashed Inn, I think is fairly clear. We, we're almost sure that the, the Old Man River Valley, just a few kilometers from us here, was a major winter camping site for the groups that used this site. And I can picture them sort of heading off with their travois, that is the uh, little sleds that their dogs pulled, hauling the meat and the fat and the hide, uh, many, many loads, many trips back and forth to the Old Man River. There they have shelter from winter storms. Uh, very importantly, they have wood for the fires that they need to keep warm in the winter. And, uh, and they have water, of course. And um, that's a classic winter campsite in the Northern Plains. And I'm sure that many of the uses of Head Smashed In were followed in the fall by a move out to the Old Man River. And then they would settle down for a number of months and continue butchering and processing the animal spoils, uh, processing the hides, uh, cutting up the, um, uh, the meat even further, and, and, uh, and of course enjoying a lot of feasting. I think that would have been the order of the day for many days after these, these events were over. It'd be a glorious time to be here and a glorious time to to watch these people sort of reveling in their good fortune. Uh, the spirits had smiled on them and made this possible, and they were, uh, they were no doubt enjoying life greatly at that time. And uh, it's, um, it's kind of the ending of the story. They move off, they leave Head Smashed In. Uh, the site becomes sort of the, the prey and pred of predators and, and vultures and, and various uh, carrion birds that would swoop down on this place and start picking at the spoils that have been left behind, the grease and the blood. And then, it, and then it will all start again, perhaps another year later, perhaps six months, perhaps many years would pass before they'd come back here. I think over the 6,000 years 
uh, nearly 6,000 years this site was used, every scenario took place at some time or another. Sometimes the jump was probably used repeatedly uh, within a matter of months, uh, numbers of events, possibly even days just separating different jump events. Other times, probably years passed before the people came back. The archaeological record isn't fine enough to allow us to distinguish that short a period of time. What we can say is this was a prime site for them to return to over and over and over again for roughly 5,800 years. And that's a record that's almost unmatched on anywhere in, in Western North America. So these were critical sites in, in the lives of these Northern Plains hunters. You could argue that the buffalo jumps, the buffalo pounds, and other major kills uh, were in many sense the lifeblood of them. They had other ways they hunted buffalo and they had other foods they ate. But I think this was really what defined them as a people in many ways. The, the ability to hunt buffalo, as we say, communally in huge numbers, killing massive amounts of, at, uh, at one time, and then butchering up the remains and living on that for months to come. That's kind of the iconic image of the Plains Hunters uh, in, in the minds of many native people today and in the minds of certainly many archaeologists who study them. And I think it's a, it is a fine image in many sense because it, it's a testimony to their skill, their ingenuity, and the sophisticated knowledge that they had of buffalo that allowed them to, to plan these traps to make them work and to bring bison over these cliffs in, in huge numbers, to drive them into wooden corrals, kill them in amounts that would then sustain them for many months through the summer. It was really a remarkable adaptation. It's something I think that they are and should be deservedly proud of, and I think that sort of humbles us as we think about how they managed to survive in a, an environment and a climate in a time period out here in the open without many of the modern conveniences that we have, I'm sure none of us would be today in a condition where we'd be able to do the same. So it's certainly a, it's a, a matter of inspiration to me, and it's something I've tried to convey in the book, that, that sense of inspiration of look at the marvelous life that these people had and, and look what they did with it in the time that they were here.